So uh, thanks for agreeing to this interview again. Um, I'm with Frédéric Dubois. I'm not saying it right. Perfect. <laughs> Managing editor of the Internet Policy Review. Uh, so I'm going to ask to start by introducing yourself and the journal a bit, if you don't mind. Sure. So um, thanks for, for having me. Um, so I'm, as you said, Frédéric Dubois. I'm uh, actually a French Canadian, uh, but living in Germany. So I'm running this, uh, this journal as a managing editor. Um, this journal is called Internet Policy Review. Um, and it's an open access journal uh, that was created eight years ago. Um, and uh, we've um, never had a print edition. So we're completely online. It's an e-journal like we like to call them in our little niche of uh, academic publishing. Um, and my background myself is as a journalist. Um, I've been doing a lot of freelance uh, journalism uh, and I also do documentary films uh, in my other life. So uh, I'm actually a managing editor 50% of my working time. Okay, um, so can you walk us a bit through the history of the Internet Policy Review? Um, were you there from the start? Or? Yeah, so the, the, the very initial spark uh, was uh, within uh, an independent research institute called Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, which is based in Berlin. And um, they, um, there, were, there was a little group of two, three researchers who had this idea of creating not just internet uh, not just um, putting out internet research um, or uh, doing the research, but actually also um, to publish internet, uh, internet uh, rights and internet focused research um, and also to experiment with publishing models. So uh, in this idea, like back in 2012, there was a lot of talk of open science, um, but there were, there were just like a handful of journals and platforms um, mm -hmm. really trying out new modes of uh, publishing. And so this institute, uh, these, well, these researchers thought about it and said, let's, let's try it out. Like one of our different research projects will actually be a publication. So uh, we need a name and, and, and so on. And so basically, uh, I hopped uh, on the bandwagon uh, in 2012 when they were having these first thoughts. And then uh, we, um, yeah, we, we, we gave it a title and uh, we did all the different steps that uh, a journal needs to go through to actually uh, start publishing, uh, which can be quite cumbersome. I can tell you more about that if you're interested, um, but basically there's a lot of, um, lot of different steps involved, including um, indexing the journal, making sure it's findable uh, in different um, indices, um, and also uh, of figuring out uh, more specifically um, the review process. Uh, as you may know, they're con conflicting or con you know, uh, um, there are different review systems that are um, um, working in parallel. The one we're using is an open peer review system, meaning that it's not blind. Um, the reviewers see each other and the reviewers also see the author. So when an article comes in at Internet Policy Review, uh, we don't, um, like you see it in many journals, we don't anonymize the article. Um, we keep the, the author there, the affiliation, um, and then we, we put it through the peer review process and we ask uh, the reviewers to be very upfront with any form of potential conflict of interest they could have if they know the person, if they've already published with the person. And we think that this open way of doing the review is much more uh, in tune with the times, but also uh, being honest about your research and who you're working with, like really disclaiming uh, around this. And so this, this is our way of doing peer review. Okay. Do you also publish the reports alongside the articles from peer review? You mean the reviews themselves? Yeah. Uh, no, we don't do uh, the whole uh, open peer review uh, thing. So what we're doing is that we have, um, you know, it's open on the side of the authors and the, the reviewers really interacting also. Uh, we all have it in one collaborative doc, actually, like the whole text is there and people just interact on it. Um, and the authors are free to comment on a comment by a reviewer. And so that we, they, they really, um, you know, build the text 
uh, together. Um, and we don't publish the reviews. So uh, we have one exception, which is an experiment we're doing with a glossary. So we put out a glossary of distributed technologies. This uh, glossary is basically a list of different terms related to blockchain technologies and other distributed technologies. Um, and these terms are defined in about two or three pages of text. So it's a very short form. And there um, we're doing open, completely open peer review, which means that uh, we, we publish the texts, uh, but they're work in progress texts. And so reviewers are approached and they're asked to review out in the open. So directly on our platform, they comment the texts and then the authors pick up uh, whatever they get in terms of review and um, refine their article or their in this case, glossary entry. And then there's a second publication date where then it's a set in stone, basically, a glossary term that is then, uh, that is then there for, for all readers to see. Okay, so as far as I get it, peer review is one of the things you've been very thoughtful about in terms of making it an open journal. What are other aspects you really have something very distinctive from more classic publication systems? Well, when we started, actually, which was quite uh, distinctive, uh, was the fact that we didn't go, um, we didn't ask readers um, to pay to see the content. So a lot of academic journals, you'll see that. It's, uh, it's also a tendency we see in journalism, although that's a different debate. Um, but in terms of academic journals, a lot of academic, uh, academic journals ask you to subscribe um, to their journal, either through your institution. Uh, but in the case of a lot of people, or many people actually in southern countries, or even in northern countries where uh, the institutions do not su subscribe to these journals, um, they simply don't have access to the full article. So what they get is an abstract, maybe two, three paragraphs, and then that's it. So 2012, when we started the journal, uh, there were quite a lot uh, of journals already uh, saying, no, uh, we need this to be open access for every reader to see it. Um, and, um, and, and we were part of that movement. So I wouldn't say we were pioneers in that uh, and less so even today because there are quite a lot of open access journals out there. Um, there's a, even a thing called the, the directory of open access journals that I can really recommend where you see a lot of journals that um, uh, in, in every field, in every discipline uh, that publish um, in, in an open access fashion. So it really means the access is open. But maybe one uh, further distinguishing factor um, is that we don't um, ask for publishing costs. So I discussed the reader side. So it's free for people to actually see the HTML articles or the PDF versions of these articles. Um, but then there's also the question of, yeah, but um, do the authors need to pay? And funnily, funnily enough, I mean, in journalism, it would be the other side, uh, the other way around, <laughs> meaning that the authors want to be paid for the work they do. In academia, it's um, unfortunately been a tradition that uh, authors uh, should are asked to pay. Often it's not the individual herself or himself paying, but it's the institution uh, paying the journal for publishing that article open access. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, this, this thing of asking authors to, to pay is called APCs, article processing charges. Um, and they're often very obscure in the journals that uh, practice this. We, we're not exactly sure why do they ask $800, $1,000 uh, or more than that for this specific article, you know, how they come up with that number. That's uh, quite, quite difficult to understand. So we didn't want to, to to do that because we we really believe in the fact that everybody should be able to hand in articles and have the same right um, to publish in our journal uh, and so we we decided not to to levy any charges on that side so that could be also a distinguishing factors now um, if I go back to the to the author side uh, to the sorry the reader side um, the, the thing that we also push or we've been pushing since the beginning of the journal is to have not only the articles published um, accessible to all, but also in terms of accessibility principles uh, to make sure that the articles 
are um, can be viewed by people with um, um, seeing impairment or um, people who, who have uh, disabilities that they can really engage with the articles also. So this is our understanding um, of open access is that you don't just put the things out there uh, in a format that people that, that a lot of people cannot access, but you actually offer um, accessible PDFs, for instance. So this would be one little distinguishing factor where we're trying to, yeah, maybe enlarge a little bit this, this idea of open access. So what is a more accessible format of PDF? Like, what does it look like compared to more classic versions? Well, you could you could you could see that on policyreview.info. <laughs> so that would be one one short answer. Um, but uh, it's it's basically very similar for people without disabilities. It looks pretty much the same uh, as a, a normal PDF. It's just that there are tags uh, in, in there uh, so that when it's 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 completely machine readable, and so it's possible for. Uh, everyone to actually get, um, you know, meta uh, information um, if they want um, on the different sections of uh, an article. Um, it's uh, very easy for, um, yeah, machines to read it, so everybody can basically um, can basically have access. But in terms of just the visuals or the aesthetics, it's pretty much the the same thing. Okay, that sounds very nice. I have to say. Um, so, is this also in relation to the um, uh, web content accessibility guidelines that you're following? Yes, well, not the PDFs themselves, but uh, <laughs> yes, the, 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 the website, we're really trying to make sure that the contrasts, for instance, on our website, uh, you know, work also for, for people who have, uh, uh, who, who cannot see properly uh, the, the distinctions between the color coding and, and stuff like that. So. We're trying to offer a design of the website that is, uh, you know, taking that uh, into account. Um, and yes, we follow the, the W3C um, uh, web accessibility guidelines. Yes. Nice. Um, so another thing I saw you have that is not something I've seen in many places are open abstracts. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? Yes, open abstracts is an idea we actually that came <laughs> from some brainstorming uh, internally uh, with our uh, student uh, assistant, um, Patrick uh, Richard, who's uh, with us for a number of years and really, uh, really creative. And uh, he's um, come up with this idea of, you know, why wouldn't we start publishing things a bit earlier at an earlier stage? Um, meaning that when people are sending in ideas to a conference, for instance, um, and you know, often you're not exactly oriented if this concept has maybe already been um, uh, published somewhere else, or if there might be some other influences that you can benefit on, uh, from. So we decided to open this section of um, sending in extended abstracts, meaning just uh, not, not full papers, but really like uh, two pages of text uh, where you're actually testing a notion, a concept, or uh, an argument. And uh, so uh, this, this is why we came up with this open abstract idea, uh, which is basically, um, again, like the glossary terms, use this solution also. Um, it's, it's basically just a functionality where you can very easily publish with us. Uh, it's moderated very quickly. And within um, a very short period of time, um, the authors get feedback and it's guaranteed feedback because we uh, make sure the, to approach different reviewers who can give some quick comments. It's not a full peer review, but it's definitely um, um, a way of getting quick feedback before you hand a paper into a conference, before you hand it into a journal. It's testing ideas. It doesn't even need to be uh, at Internet Policy Review. Uh, but if you're planning on submitting an article to some, you know, journal with a high impact factor, for instance, this would be also an interesting term to explore, um, then you can, you can come to us and test an idea. Okay, so you, you said high impact factor would be an interesting term to <laughs> explore, so I, I kind of want to push you in that direction. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> if me. you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, sure. Should I, should I expand on that? Yeah. Uh, please. 
yeah so uh yeah maybe um I'm, I'm mentioning that with the impact factor because it's been um, often seen as the gold standard um, in academic publishing for a number of years. This um, has a bit gone away, but it's, it's still around, especially in English speaking countries, um, where in the research traditions, um, you know, also if you're, you're looking to get a good position at a university as an author, uh, you try to publish in journals that are um, that have a good uh, prestige that have some there there's no like one way it depends on the disciplines but in general there's no one way uh, to rank journals uh, there are different rankings uh, out there uh, a lot of them from private or for-profit companies um, they're all of different qualities you need really need to uh, focus on it to to understand how the rankings are made and there's one thing called the impact factor which is given by a number of indices uh, but one of them is uh, the web of science uh, index and they calculate um, some some form with a, some form of formula uh, based on the number of citations from the articles published in a, a given year in a given journal. So they look at the number of articles, they look at the number of citations over uh, uh, that period of time, and then uh, with the, their formula, they generate an impact factor. So they say, if as an author, you want to publish in that journal, uh, you have an impact factor of two or of one. Uh, so you're trying to, 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 to get the journal which has the best impact factor, meaning that you'd have the most probability uh, that your article will get cited. So it's a very much a citation focused um, or obsessed, one could say, um, manner of um, seeing the quality or trying to figure out the quality of a journal. And we kind of don't really believe in that. We understand that it's important in um, academic life to have citations. Uh, it's important for um, uh, articles to be uh, recognized, to be seen, and to be used. If they're, you know, the usefulness, of course, is important. Uh, but we believe there are other uh, measures of how you actually um, um, can establish if a journal is a quality journal or not. And so we've um, we've always uh, kept away from the impact factor as long as we could, but we're also uh, in indices ourselves. So the the Internet Policy Review is now in the Web of Science Index. Um, it's also in Scopus, and eventually there will be an impact factor also uh, for Internet Policy Review. Um, this said. Um, for us, it hasn't really made a big difference. Um, authors have sent in articles, submitted articles, uh, independently of the fact that we have an impact factor or not. Um, and um, we we believe that this has been, um, up until now, quite a big. Um, it, it had it has put the brakes uh, on open access because it's been so focused on this aspect of citation that it disregarded other elements of how uh, science can, or academic publishing can be organized, can, where there can be innovation, for instance. Um, and just to give you an example, like, um, you know, um, journals that have this impact factor um, actually benefit from uh, better funding situations. Um, they, they're, they're much more, um, yeah, they, they have uh, much more possibilities than small time journals um, that might be qualitatively very good, um, but might have a harder time of, of, of getting funding. So kind of building on that, um, what do you think are the main kind of barriers to getting more open access journals? And what are the, you know, kind of difficulties you've encountered in establishing the Internet Policy Review? Well, that's that's a good question. I mean, there are a couple of hurdles um, how to establish uh, open access journals. Um, I'll just repeat that. Uh, oh, can you can you just give me one second? Can can we then? Sure, we're gonna be able to edit afterwards, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, just give me one second because I need to to see yep. uh, what that is.
sorry for this. No worries. So, so um, uh, Helena, you you were asking, uh, what were the main hurdles or what are the the difficulties of establishing a, a open access journals, right? Yes, exactly. And um, there there are quite a quite a few hurdles. Um, the 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 main one is is basically the the funding situation. Uh, it's but that's not so much different for an open access journal as a closed access journal. Um, but uh, it's it's still quite a challenge to start a journal in and of itself. You know, you need to figure out so many different aspects, not just of publishing, but also of indexing and, and getting you know some reputation going. Um, but one of the main difficulties with open access is that um, journals that we call diamond open access journals, which is something like Internet Policy Review, is called that because it's a fully open access journal. It has never been uh, closed access or proprietary. And uh, the difficulty with diamond open access journals is uh, that there's often um, like libraries, for instance, um, which is one of the main funders of science publication. Um, the university libraries, they don't have dedicated budgets for diamond open access journals. They have budgets for paying uh, for APCs, these article processing charges. So if your journal has this model, then, okay, you can go to the library and say, look, we need, uh, you know, offsetting costs. And can you, uh, and so you can invoice for that. But as a, a diamond open access journal, you don't have this kind of pay for content uh, relationship. Um, so this has been a struggle. And um, interestingly enough, there's a, a quite a, a few positive developments within uh, university libraries who are now, uh, at least in Europe, I'm not sure about the US context, but uh, in Europe, they're opening quite a lot um, to supporting diamond open access journals. Um, and so they're using different formula to, um, to fund uh, new initiatives or journals uh, that don't have APCs. So that would be really like the main <laughs> uh, category or the main difficulty is really to get the funding. Um, and other, otherwise it's um, also to get um, one, one I guess one of the major hurdles is that uh, the field is already quite um, populated. There are a lot of journals. So the question is really, uh, does the world need a new journal, right? Uh, and so you really need to make sure to orient yourself um, in terms of, is there, um, um, a, 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 let's say, a disciplinary um, consortia or is there um, like are there disciplines where you fit in or are you an interdisciplinary journal and do you have a niche there uh, for you to occupy and if the answer is yes then you, you can go for it but very often the answer is no uh, so you you really need to find some kind of characteristic for your journal that really makes a difference compared to the number, the huge number of journals that are really out there. So these would be like two, two things um, I would say are, are really important to watch out for. Okay. That, that's very interesting and that echoes quite a lot of my experience as an early career researcher um, having to publish. Um, that being said, um, I also saw that the Internet Policy Review is part of the Radical Open Access Collective. Um, can you tell me a bit about this? Yes, uh, so our journal is part of a couple of different uh, networks. Um, one is the, the, the Free Journal Network, another one is the Radical Open Access um, uh, Collective. The, the Radical Open Access Collective is, in, is based in the UK, uh, and they're very much um, a very open, informal kind of network uh, who are pushing for diamond open access. So they're pushing in favor of having scholar-led, so journals that are really initiated within uh, research institutes and who are not dependent on big publishers. Um, and they're trying to encourage them exchanging some um, you know, capacities. Uh, there's a lot of capacity building uh, happening within that network. We're sharing experiences, we're doing workshops together, um, we're 
uh, we just ran workshops where we had um, you know, members of the Radical Open Access Collective who took part in trying to figure out what are the best business models to have sustainable open access publishing, uh, or what are the technical uh, elements you need in, in, uh, in a journal platform, like what are the, the, the editorial systems you can use, what are, um, you know, how, how can you best publish uh, and, and make sure that the reviewers um, um, hand in their reviews in a short period of time, how can you be transparent about your publishing, all these questions, we, we basically share them. Uh, among us ourselves in that radical open access collective and it's it's one of the initiatives that are more pushy uh, towards uh, you know making sure that this tiny segment which is the scholar led journals uh, but that often have very strong and qualitatively high level uh, publications um, to make sure that this this little niche basically has a voice and uh, they're, um, yeah, they're, they've been very uh, good to us uh, up until now. Okay, that, that's very nice. Um, so actually, do you see any major difference in the cost of operating a diamond open access journal versus more classical journals? There, um, no, it's, it really depends. There is no one size fit all, uh, fits all. There is, there are so many different disciplines. Uh, so it, it depends what type of journal you're operating. Also, it depends if you're paying your people or not. Like a lot of people um, don't, uh, a lot of people, a lot of journals, I mean, don't really pay um, for the editorial work. Um, so in our case, um, my work is paid. Um, and I work with academic editors um, who, um, in, on their behalf, they, 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 they get funding from their institutions where they're associated, right? Um, other journals have a totally different model where it's to completely voluntary. Um, so there's, it's, it's difficult answer to give. Um, but um, for sure, the like in terms of the cost structure, I don't think it it, it it's so different. Um, but what might be different is that if, if you are a journal associated with a publisher, um, you actually get a lot of um, economies of scale. Just to give you an example, a publisher has a platform, and if you're a journal within that publisher, um, your journal is basically on this platform that uh, technically is being developed and, and, and further developed and, and optimized uh, by a team of IT people. In the case of Internet Policy Review, we're just a tiny team uh, of three people and uh, with a, a big network. Uh, so we're exchanging a lot of information and we're developing some stuff ourselves uh, but there's a limit to what we can actually develop you see um, and and so in that sense that might be a limitation um, for a scholar led journals um, and diamond open access journals in particular um, because the budgets are relatively small in general um, that it's um, yeah it's hard to be uh, innovative at the same time um, and so this is why uh, we're, we are convinced we're thinking that um, a diamond open access journals who play that play a really really important role um, should be supported uh, by public funds or uh, by other uh, foundation funds um, and it's not often the case okay um, I, so I think I, I'm kind of reaching the end of the questions I had prepared um, so in general are there any advice you would like to transmit to either authors, reviewers, or editors at other journals? Actually, um, maybe an advice for researchers who are starting to publish or who've just had one or two experiences in publishing articles, it would be to really um, take a hard look at the journal that you, you're, you're thinking of publishing with. You, you know, screen it, try to understand the governance structure of the journal, who is behind the journal, not just the editorial board, which can be a number of plants, basically, or flowers, you know, it's just names that are listed. But then, okay, what is it exactly? Are people engaged in that journal? Are people really making sure that the reviews are high quality? Uh, and what does the journal stand for in terms of open access? Like, um, there's right now a situation where a lot of publishers, and I, I don't want to be too tough on publishers, but a lot of publishers are making a lot of money at this stage um, with, um, you know, 
a quality that is sometimes not not clear and this is especially for us like coming from the scholar led journal segment it's kind of hard to take when we know that for our funding for our side we we have very difficult time of securing funding and so this is why i'm saying um you know make sure to think about where you want to publish and if your article at the end of the day is accessible to everyone to read because uh, i think it's very important uh, for science not to be closed uh, but really to be opened up and accessible to all uh, so that would be my my advice just to take a bit more time also maybe another advice is when you you're actually thinking of a research project and you're 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 budgeting your research project put a little budget line on the publishing aspect, the open access publishing. Uh, plan that in because at the end of the day, uh, this makes a difference and supports um, the opening of science. Thanks. I think that's all very good advice. Um, so if there's anything we haven't touched on or that you would like to add, um, now is the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me think. Um, yeah, maybe one more thing that I could add is that um, from an editor's perspective, like doing a journal is really fun. It's a lot of challenges, um, but it's really fun to do um, because uh, you being an editor of a, a diamond open access journal online is basically being within a network of, of researchers. Um, and it's, um, it's very stimulating. And at the same time, it's, it still has this component of organizing science. You know, you're, you're basically um, trying to figure out what the best way is uh, to open science. So I think the role of an editor in a journal is quite uh, key, if I might say, uh, in, in where, um, yeah, where, where science is going towards, you know, what, what type of science we want. And uh, so this, again, uh, if, if you're, you're thinking of maybe doing some editorial work, uh, further down the road, um, you might want to start with editing a special issue, which is often very nice also, and then getting into academic publishing. Um, yeah, and as I said, from, from my experience of eight years of being a managing editor, uh, it's really fun to do uh, because it's innovative at uh, every step. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so I've asked all I had to ask now. Uh, so we're pretty much done. I don't want to take more of your time. Um, but that was pretty fantastic. I've actually learned a lot. Uh, so thanks. Oh, yeah. Wow. OK. <laughs> um, Excellent. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you're a researcher, that's a lot of the side you don't see, to be honest. So yes. that, that, that's pretty good at getting to know it as well. Um, yes, yes. Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much for the opportunity. And